While Emperor Gregorios was busy making preparations for his invasion force, General Pagani consolidated his position in Italy. Pagani was fiercely involved in the cultish beliefs of the Knights of Adana. Over 30 years ago, Pagani was one of the Christian knights who stormed the walls of Jerusalem. During the power struggle that ensued over control of the Holy Land, Pagani met Count Austin, who was promising men a life of glory and fortune if they joined him in seizing the defenseless Roman territory of Adana. Pagani spent the next few years fighting in Adana, building a vast fortune just as Count Austin had promised. Pagani began to revere Count Austin, as if the latter were a prophet. Then, in the year 1087, Emperor Alexios came to Adana with a massive army, and Count Austin was forced into a battle. In the battle, a Roman horseman managed to pierce through Pagani's helmet with his spear, cutting through the area around Pagani's eye, giving him a distinctive scar. Although Pagani managed to survive the battle, he soon found out that Count Austin did not. He desperately tried to rescue the Count's body, but the Roman forces were overwhelming. Pagani was forced to flee the battlefield in tears, crying as he swore that he would get revenge for Count Austin. In the years that followed, Pagani followed the knights as they relocated their order to Italy. Just like all his brothers in arms, Pagani swore an oath of vengeance against the Roman Empire. He soon rose through the ranks of the order, becoming one of its highest ranking members. Pagani then devoted years of his life fighting to help anti-Pope Sylvester build an Italian army large enough to invade the Roman territories to the south. Now, after his victory at the Battle of Pescara, Pagani had eliminated much of the Roman army in Italy. He immediately sought to capitalize on his victory by invading Roman territory in Apulia and Campania, seizing several important towns. After a brief siege, Pagani even captured the city of Naples. His men slaughtered the city's Roman garrison, killing all of Campania's provincial officials. News of the defeats at Pescara and Naples worried Pope Pascal. He feared a similar massacre of his own supporters in Rome if the city were to fall. But Rome was now isolated. It would not be long before the Adonans attempted to take the city. Pagani began marching south to chase the remnants of the Roman provincial army that had fought at Pescara. This bought time for Pascal and several of his closest supporters to flee Rome. They disguised as local merchants and slipped through hostile territory, eventually seeking refuge in the city of Bari. At this time, Sylvester was getting overly excited about the prospects of ruling Rome and becoming the sole leader of the Catholic Church. He was impatient and wanted to enter the city as soon as possible. Sylvester then sent orders to Pagani, commanding him to immediately march north and begin the Siege of Rome. Sylvester was so confident in victory that he sent a letter to Emperor Henry, asking him to come celebrate the return of Rome to the Holy Roman Empire. The city of Rome was ill-defended, possessing a small garrison. Many of the defenders were also demoralized upon hearing that the Pope had abandoned them. Despite this, the city was able to hold out for several months, before surrendering to Pagani in early 1117. Just like in Naples, Pagani ordered the execution of the city's garrison, as well as any other officials who were deemed to be loyal to Constantinople. Sylvester was ecstatic. He held a massive parade through the city of Rome to celebrate his victory. A few months later, Emperor Henry arrived in the city. A ceremony was held where Henry proclaimed Sylvester to be the Bishop of Rome and the head of the Catholic Church. Under Henry's new system, the Holy Roman Emperor could now select his own puppet pope, 
as well as all the bishops of the Catholic Church. At a dinner that was held later that day, Henry congratulated Pagani and Sylvester on their victories. Henry's dynasty had been humiliated and undermined by the popes of Rome for decades. He was overjoyed to have finally asserted imperial dominance over the pope. Henry promised to join Pagani with 10,000 of his best men as they moved to conquer the remainder of southern Italy in the next campaigning season. Meanwhile, Pope Pascal, as well as a portion of the College of Cardinals, arrived at the gates of Barry. Many of the cardinals were angry with Pascal, believing that he did too little to counter Sylvester's growing influence in the churches and governments of Italy over the past decade. In addition, Pascal had refused to formally excommunicate Henry, Sylvester, or any of the Knights of Adana, believing reconciliation was still possible. Now, with grief and stress overcoming him, Pascal fell gravely ill. The Pope passed away after three days of agonizing sickness. The Cardinals unanimously elected a new leader, a man named Gelasius. Gelasius was a charismatic man who promised to revitalize the Catholic Church. He declared that the Pope would be subordinate to no emperor, and that he would retake Rome from the clutches of the Holy Roman Empire and the Knights of the Dun, no matter the cost. But this would not happen anytime soon. In 1117, Pagani and Emperor Henry again went on the offensive, capturing large swaths of territory. The remnants of the Roman army fled rather than face certain defeat in battle. During the campaign, Pagani and Emperor Henry became inseparable friends. They hunted together in the Italian countryside, drank together at dinner, and constantly chatted with each other about the daily occurrences of their lives. Pagani declared that he had never met a man with as great conviction as Emperor Henry. Henry's friendship with Pagani gave the latter free reign to do as he wished in the southern Italian countryside. Pagani personally took part in many atrocities, burning villages, senselessly slaughtering innocents, and allowing the Knights of Adana to loot whatever they could find. However, Pagani did not allow rape, in one famous case, executing one of his men who raped a captive villager. Nevertheless, Pagani was eager to slaughter many in the name of the Knights of Adana. To the people of southern Italy, it appeared that there was no hope. But in 1118, reinforcements finally arrived. Emperor Gregorios landed outside Barry with an army over 30,000 men strong. Almost immediately, Pagani and Emperor Henry moved to attack Gregorios before the Roman forces had time to organize. But the Romans had been planning this invasion for years. They knew exactly what to do. The Roman army immediately formed up for a battle outside the walls of Barry. Gregorios hoped to win a decisive victory, break the siege of Barry, and begin the reconquest of southern Italy. Before the battle, Gregorio spoke to Wilfred and Manuel, noting the similarities between what was happening now and Emperor Romanos' invasion of Italy over 40 years ago. Manuel warned Gregorio to be cautious, reminding the Emperor that Romanos faced major setbacks in Italy due to his uncontrollable ambition and boldness. Gregorio promised Manuel that he would be careful and calculated. The Emperor was prepared to fight in Italy for many years if need be. Gregorios then spoke to Wilfred, telling him that after all these years, they would finally be able to avenge Alfred's death. Wilfred wished the Emperor good luck, telling him that Alfred would be proud of how far Gregorios had come, and then proceeded to his position on the battlefield. By now, both the Roman army and the Imperial army had assembled outside of Barry. Both armies had roughly 30,000 men. On the Roman side, the Vrangian Guard made up the front line of the Roman army, commanded by Wilfred. Behind them, thousands of professionally trained spearmen and archers made up the bulk of the army. These men were commanded by Carolos. 
On the Roman flanks, Manuel and Briennios were in charge of a large number of veteran Roman horsemen, including the well-equipped Roman cataphracts. They were supplemented by a large number of peltas. The Imperial Army was composed of thousands of German and Italian spearmen. These men had all spent the past few years fighting battle after battle in Italy. They were battle-hardened and very experienced. In addition, the Imperial Army also counted a corps of the famous Genoese crossbowmen among their ranks. But the deadliest part of the Imperial Army were the thousands of German knights that dominated the army's flanks. Lastly, Pagani and the Knights of Adana themselves supported the core of the Imperial Army, acting as reserves. As the battle was about to begin, Gregorios rode up and down the ranks of his army. He gave a speech urging his men to fight to the bitter end. He reminded them that they were on the coast of Italy. They had nowhere to retreat except the sea. Furthermore, he rallied his troops with a war cry, claiming that the Knights of Adana had humiliated the Roman Empire for generations, and now was finally the time to crush the Knights, and for the Roman Empire to achieve glory in a conquest of Italy. To start the battle, the Roman army advanced towards the enemy. The Varangians and spearmen began the charge, hoping to swiftly breach the Imperial center. But the Romans were easy targets on the open field of battle. The Genoese crossbowmen unleashed volley after volley of arrows onto the Romans, wreaking havoc on the Roman army and causing enormous casualties. Amidst the chaos, the German knights began their charge against the Roman flanks. For a moment, it appeared that the entire Roman army would be routed in one fell swoop. Gregorios was stunned. He rushed to the front lines, urging his men to regroup and brave the storm of arrows. Hundreds of Romans now lay dead on the battlefield. From atop the walls of Barry, Pope Gelasius witnessed the unfolding disaster. He prayed to God for a miracle to save the Roman army. Suddenly, a massive storm gathered in the clouds over the city, flooding the battlefield with an ocean's worth of rain. The downpour soaked the Genoese crossbows with water, ruining them instantly. The Roman archers were able to untie their bowstrings, preventing their own bows from being ruined. The Roman infantry then regrouped, and launched a second massive charge against the Genoese. The disciplined crossbowmen managed to retreat behind the safety of the German and Italian spearmen, avoiding many casualties. A massive melee then broke out as the Roman center crashed into the ranks of the Imperial Army. Meanwhile, Manuel and his horsemen were engaged in a brutal struggle with some of the German knights. The rain had turned the soil into mud, making movement extremely difficult for the heavily armored cavalry of both sides. However, this allowed Manuel to sneak many of his peltas around the German knights, assaulting the German flanks. Surrounded on all sides and fighting a more mobile force, these German knights were butchered, fighting to the last man. Manuel showed no mercy. But on the other side of the battlefield, things were looking more grim for the Romans. Briennios, hoping to win personal glory, had charged ahead without his peltas before the rain soaked the battlefield. The German knights were now overwhelming Briennios and his horsemen. Gregorio saw the situation unfold, and he rallied some of his cavalry to rescue Briennios. Pagani quickly learned that the Roman Emperor was charging into the battle. He ordered the Knights of Adana to move in and assist the German Knights. A fierce fight then broke out between the Knights of Adana and the Romans. Roman Peltas began arriving and assaulting the Knights of Adana. Pagani desperately searched for Gregorios in the battlefield, hoping to kill the Emperor once and for all. But Pagani soon received news that devastated him. On the other side of the battlefield, Emperor Henry had taken his bodyguards and the remaining German cavalry to reinforce the heavily diminished right flank. But Manuel Lapida and his numerically superior force of cavalry and peltas overwhelmed Emperor Henry's position. 
Henry was even killed in the fighting. When Pagani heard this, he lost heart, and he and his Knights of Adana frantically retreated from the battlefield, incurring many casualties. Outflanked and surrounded, the remnants of the Imperial Army scattered, fleeing the battlefield. The exhausted Roman army did not make any effort to pursue them. Although the Romans had suffered enormous losses, they had won the battle. In the aftermath of the battle, as Gregorios walked through the field, he had deja vu. He swore he could recognize this place, and a large sense of dread overcame him. But that feeling soon faded. After the battle, the Romans celebrated in the streets of Barry. Word soon spread of Gelasius' prayer in the midst of battle, and many in Barry began to consider Gelasius a prophet who had curried the favor of God. Gregorios himself met with Gelasius. Gregorios and Gelasius engaged in a long conversation about spirituality and religion. Gelasius said that the emperor would go down in history if he marched to Rome. This was exactly what Gregorios wanted to hear and he began to accept many of Gelasius' words as prophetic and that of a saint. During their conversation, Gelasius and Gregorios agreed that Alexius had made a mistake in not attempting to reintegrate the Orthodox and Catholic churches. Gregorios also agreed that Patriarch Valentinos is dangerous, and that the unrest of the past few decades was evidence that the Orthodox Church needed to be controlled by an independent pope, elected by the College of Cardinals. Gregorios personally promised Gelasius that once the Roman army captured Rome, the Pope would be reinstated as the supreme ruler of all the churches in the Empire. But Gregorios urged Gelasius to keep this a secret for now. Gregorios told no one of his plans. The Roman army spent the rest of the year recapturing city after city in southern Italy. Pagani attempted to resist the Roman advance, but he was forced to retreat time and time again due to the overwhelming odds against his favor. By 1119, much of southern Italy had returned to Roman rule. Pagani and his army retreated to Rome, hoping to hold out in the city while reinforcements arrived. The time had come. Gregorius ordered his army to march on Rome, 